Contemporary Muslim Fashions is a major exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt in New York. The show explores how Muslim women are reshaping today's fashion industry to be more inclusive. Ranging from high-end fashion dresses to sportswear, the show features 80 ensembles from renowned and emerging designers. It also includes photos, interviews and even a music clip. Organizers say that perhaps much of the credit belongs to a new generation of bold, urban and sophisticated designers. Most of the designers, artists and influencers in the exhibition are Muslim women under the age of 40 and they've created a wardrobe suitable not only for stylish Muslim women but also for themselves. There is no look to being a Muslim. There are Muslims who you don't even know are Muslim, right? Um, to the ones that are visibly very much so Muslim um, and dresses traditionally and there's everything in between. And so what I bring to the table is, hey, there's other Muslims who are kind of alternative that also want to be accepted and not othered. I'm gonna always rock my turban and hijab, but for the rest of it, it's up for interpretation to me. And although most of the designs include a hijab, designers say modesty doesn't only address those who wear a headscarf or even those in the Muslim community. Modesty to me has so many layers to it. Um, as a Muslim woman, of course, the, the, the natural thing you would think about is the way that I'm dressed in more of a modest fashion. Um, but as a Muslim woman, modesty is a value and it's a virtue that is incredibly important across both genders, both men and women. Um, and so it's this inward humility and outward humility. It's um, an unassuming nature, but it's also a confidence that you carry as well and knowing who you are and being proud of that identity. It certainly has a lot to do with the hijab itself, although um, it is a misconception that we wear hijab out of modesty. It's actually in order to be identified as Muslim women. The exhibition represents various regional styles and interpretations of the concept of modesty. Many young designers from the Middle East, for example, have created new versions of the abaya, a robe that extends from the neck to the ankle. Indonesian designers embrace the rich textile heritage of their homeland by using luxurious materials such as batik to create contemporary looks. And there are designs such as full covered swimwear that encourage Muslim women to participate in sports and water activities. Besides all their efforts, the modest designers emphasize a greater change on the global stage. We need to be able to create a new narrative around fashion. Fashion represents beauty, it represents women. It crosses again all economic, social, and religious barriers. So when we see fashion, we should see diversity. When we see fashion, we should see inclusion. I am challenging the fashion world and just the industry in general to step up and to make that commitment and to be more of a part of diversity and inclusion. Journalists, bloggers, influencers and consumers have managed to draw international attention to the modest style, according to the show's organisers. And what they all had in common was the desire to be represented and seen. Fashion writer Khode Katibi joins me. Hi there, it's good to have you with us today on Showcase. So, let's start with this. We've been calling it modest fashion since the beginning of the show, because this is, you know, the most common way to refer to it, I guess. But then I want to put that position, I mean, my position in, in question uh, for a second. How necessary do you think it, it is to have a separate category called modest fashion? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that what is really important to recognize first and foremost is that um, modesty isn't really defined in one way. You know, modesty is really a personal expression of what feels modest to you in a particular environment, in a particular day. Um, so I think this idea of modesty is sort of eclectic um, and I think can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But then again, I think the, the boundaries of a lot of fashion categories are always sort of fluid and ambiguous. Um, but I do think that it, it, it's helpful, I think, to, to think about the ways in which 
um, certain cuts are, certain people um, associating with certain fashions and styles. I think it's helpful for some people to identify within something, but it's not really like a style or a trend, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are all really interesting. I want to dig deeper into some of the points that you just made here. But before that, some people call it Islamic fashion. Some people say, you know, hijabi fashion or modest fashion. Does any of them make more sense to you? No, no. <laughs> I think calling modest fashion Muslim fashion or hijabi fashion, which I think is even worse, um, erases a large like population of Muslims who don't wear the hijab or Muslims who don't wear modest clothes. Um, who are still Muslim and still identify as Muslim and modestly just look something different to them. So I, I think that calling something Islamic fashion or hijabi fashion, I think really erases a large part of um, just the general population of Muslims or non-Muslims that also dresses in a place that would be identified as modest by others. Okay, so um, some people say that, you know, this category, this term, I mean, however you might want to call it, uh, is necessary because you know, Muslim women are claiming space through this, you know, category that's designated for them. But some people say that it makes them feel further alienated. So which one do you think is, is the case here? And I mean, I think the fashion industry is a very interesting place for um, Muslim women. I think it's absolutely necessary for Muslim women to be taking up space. Um, but I think what's really important is that we do that on our terms. Um, and thinking about our global community of Muslims when we're, we're talking about fashion. And what I mean by that is that, A, we see a lot of fast fashion brands like Nike, H&M, that uh, are now coming out with either like modest wear, hijabs, different things like this that are trying to make it seem like they're representing Muslims, they're being inclusive of Muslims, but really they just want the Muslim dollar at the expense of Muslim garment workers. And so I think what's really important as Muslims that we recognize is that um, the garment industry, the people who are making our clothes, majority around the world are women of color and particularly Muslim women of color who are working class, working in sweatshops. Um, so I think when we talk about Muslim fashion or fashion in general um, or Muslim women taking up space in fashion spaces, I think we also have to recognize that Muslim women have always been over um, represented in, in fashion spaces, but always as uh, garment workers and never actually their voices, never actually their agency their economic mobility. Um, so Muslim women have always been part of the international fashion scene for forever, but um, at sites of oppression um, at the end of the day. Okay. And uh, I mean, you pointing out to regional differences and cultural differences. Um, you know, with the, a global understanding of modest fashion, if there is only one definition of modest, then do you think, uh, does it mean that it's getting globalized and it runs the risk of wiping out local interpretations of what modest is? And that, that's a really interesting question as well. I think that, um, I do think that any time that we don't allow ourselves to really be the ones who are dictating, the ones who are setting the culture um, and recognizing all the different complications and variances of what modesty looks like, um, I think it will always get sort of whitewashed. It'll always get taken up by large brands who are, have no relationship uh, to Muslim communities and only just want to exploit or um, gain profit off of Muslim communities. And so I think what's really important is that we like support the Muslim designers who are not using sweatshops, you know, not exploiting Muslim women labor, um, small designers um, from different backgrounds. I think also recognizing that modesty has a history in so many different cultures. Um, in the United States, for example, the fact that so many black Muslims don't actually get a lot of um, space also to be represented or even um, black people in Turkey or in across the Middle East. And I think that we have to recognize all of the different um, di minorities as well as histories of modest wear and Muslims in our countries and how their culture has actually influenced modest culture at large. And what even what we think is like, oh, Turkish or oh, American Muslim culture actually comes from deeper histories of ethnic minorities that have either been erased um, or marginalized or oppressed. Okay, uh, I mean, after you mentioning global brands coming into uh, the game here as well, I, you know, really have time for one last question very quickly. But um, do you think that, I mean, we talked about how uh, the idea of modesty changes from, you know, one context, cultural context to another. Do you think 
uh, the modest, in modest fashion, is a Eurocentric way of looking at it because, you know, it's all globalized and, you know, what's modest for me is probably not modest for you. And, you know, how, in that sense, do you think we're being too Eurocentric in this one? Interesting. Um, I think that I, I think that a lot of Eurocentric beauty standards have always defined the fashion industry at large. And we see ourselves, all of us, sort of really trying to have to unlearn that, um, try to challenge what we think is beautiful based on who's telling us what these things are. But I do think that um, there's so much history and culture, specifically within uh, Muslim fashion, whether it's modest or not, um, coming from Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, that is so rich and so beautiful that I think we have always sort of gravitated and, and, and supported those designers and built a lot of our fashion understandings from these communities. Um, and I think a lot of the West is a lot of copy paste, you know, that's their history is coming colonization and then copy paste and selling it um, and making it look cool suddenly. So I do think that there's a lot of complications when major fast fashion brands start taking up and stealing um, or copying Muslim designers clothes. Um, and I think that it, it's challenging because then suddenly, you know, modest wear becomes trendy when um, a big Western brand does it, but not when like our local garment worker here um, in the Middle East makes something for us. So I think that there's a lot of different places of values that we get um, our understanding of clothes from. And a lot of it is rooted in your authentic beauty standards, but I do think that it's up to us to really recognize where those histories come from, mm -hmm. why we suddenly modest clothes are exciting or cool, um, and, and and where right. sort of our relationship and role is in all of that. All right, Hoda Khatibi, unfortunately, this is all the time we have, but it was lovely having you. Thanks a lot for this.